this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul stood there and approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, and they mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Father God, I just um, thank you for your word and I thank you for the life of Stephen, Lord. Thank you for his courage, Father, for his conviction. Um, and Jesus, I pray for Damien as he comes now to um, preach your word, Lord. I pray that you'll fill him with your spirit, um, Father God, that you'll um, just open his ears, Lord, and make him attentive to all your promptings, um, that he can um, speak, Lord, um, your words to us and open our hearts, Jesus. Um, Father, we want to be um, encouraged and challenged um, by your words. We love you. Amen. Well, um, this morning on the way to the Hope Centre where we're live streaming uh, this from, um, I followed a car down the road and realised that it was Bill and I was like, oh look it's Bill, I haven't seen Bill in the flesh for a long time and he was pulling into a petrol station and then as we went a little bit further we saw Carol um, on one of her daily walks and I was like, oh it's Carol, it's so good to see Carol and I realised um, when I see people just from a distance how much I've been missing people um, and I wonder if you're feeling the same way because as, as people we're designed for relationship and we thrive with contact and we're 40 days now into the lockdown or thereabouts and for some people if you're a key worker oh, let me just say God bless you I've been praying for you every single day and what you're doing is amazing and some of you are putting yourself even at risk in order to serve other people and Thank God for you. Um, so for, for the key workers, life has gone on with hard work and commitment. For others, though, um, some of you have become furloughed. So you're not working, you're employed, but you're furloughed. You're, you find yourself at home. Um, some of you are working from home, and, uh, and so life has changed significantly. If you're a young person, maybe a, um, you go to primary school or to secondary school, um, you'll, be, you'll have been given work from school, but you'll be working at home, you'll be, be, be homeschooled, and uh, it's completely different. It's a brand new landscape. But let me just say this, this is not going to last forever. And even though it's a struggle for some of us, it also comes with incredible opportunities. We love being gathered together as the church, and... Um, I don't know about you, but I'm really missing corporate worship, standing together in a room with people praising God at the top of our voices. I'm, I'm really missing that. And I hope that in your homes, you're able to just cry out to God and to worship him and to praise him and adore him. We've had some wonderful times just as a family sitting around the piano, just worshiping God. Um, so when we come back together, I just imagine it's going to be amazing and the presence of God is going to be so wonderful and so powerful. I miss corporate worship. There's power in the gathered church. But this morning I'm going to focus on some verses in this passage in Acts where we see the power of the scattered church. And there are a few things that I wanted to say this morning from this passage 
about the power of the scattered church. The first thing is, as we read through this account in, in Acts, we see that God broke up the party. What do I mean by that? Well, when Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, was proclaiming Jesus wherever he went, he was stirring up trouble. Do you find that? Do you find that when you're on fire for God and when you're, you're living for Jesus, that some people are drawn to that and some people are offended by it? Well, some people were offended by how Stephen was behaving, but his life was transformed and he had the life of Jesus in him and it just had to come out. And some of the people who were offended were the religious leaders. He was hauled before the, the Jewish ruling council. And in that setting, he said these words, and I just think... Um, how would you have felt if you were one of those leaders? He said, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. What he means is there's still sin in them that hasn't been cut away yet. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who, who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. How would you have felt if you were one of those leaders? Of course, they were deeply offended. And it says when the members of the San Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. They even gnashed their teeth at him. And it ended up with Stephen being hauled outside and stoned to death. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. And it says at that point... It says in, at the beginning of chapter 8, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church. In Acts chapter 1, it says this about the church. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, and listen to this, enjoying the favour of of all the people. That's how they were living in Jerusalem. They'd, they'd seen the risen Jesus. They knew that there was new life through the Holy Spirit. Their, their hearts were connected. Their lives were intertwined and they were enjoying worshipping God and praising him and sharing their lives together in Jerusalem. They were happy. That's what they wanted. It was beautiful. They loved each other and everybody, everyone else around them seemed to love them too. But then when this happened with Stephen, it says that persecution broke out. Just like a fire breaks out, persecution broke out and everything changed. Everything changed from that day on. God broke up the party. Now, if you were part of the church in Jerusalem at that time, what would you have thought? Oh no, everything's going wrong. Everything that was so perfect is now spoiled. And it said that the church was scattered. In Acts um, in Acts chapter, sorry, I've just not lost my place. Let me just find it again. Here we are. Right, Acts chapter eight, verse one says this: On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and what happened after that point was that the people of God were scattered throughout the world. Now. If you were part of the church at that time, you might have thought to yourself, there is a mistake, God, you're making because this isn't how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be nice and it's supposed to be cosy and it's supposed to be friendly and it's supposed to be powerful. But within the confines that we're used to and suddenly now Jerusalem is, is a scary place and it's a difficult place and it's a place of persecution and we can't stay here any longer. And it said that those apart from the apostles who were Christians were then scattered. At the moment in our nation and around the world, I believe that there is a shaking going on. In the first email that I sent out to the, the church when all of this began to happen, I said that I, I believe that there was a shaking going on. And when something is shaking, it's almost like the things that are truly important remain and the things that are unimportant get, get shaken away. And if you think about how God uses trials and difficulties in our lives, or even in nature, think about nature, think about how gold is refined in fire, and how when a butterfly is being released from, from its chrysalis, it has to force its way out, and the pressure of forcing its way out from the chrysalis actually strengthens its wings. Or think about a pearl, a, a piece of sand in, in a mother of pearl that 
that is an irritant. There's something irritating about that sand being there, but around that sand then layers and layers of, of pearl um, are formed until this beautiful pearl emerges. Or think about a broken container full of perfume, that when the container is broken, it releases this fragrance into the room. God uses difficulties, even persecution, trouble, strife, all of those things that we dislike and hate he uses those things sometimes God has to break up the party in order for us to realize what's truly important and I would say to you at this time don't waste this opportunity this is an opportunity and it would be very easy for those of us who are at home a lot more than usual at the moment to put on Netflix or put on YouTube and just lull ourselves to sleep with entertainment but in this hour, it's so vitally important that the church is fully awake, that we are awake to this hour that we're in because God is doing something incredible in our time. And so I would say, love God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Get close to Jesus. Don't fall asleep. Wake up. In fact, somebody said to me last week that if you want to wake somebody up who's in a deep sleep, you shake them. And I wonder if God is shaking his church at the moment to wake us up. So get close to Jesus, but also get close to one another. It's very easy at this time because we're not gathering together in rooms, because we're not seeing people face to face, for people to be out of sight, out of mind. And so I would encourage you to be proactive in getting in touch with people. Get in touch with your friends, but also get in touch with people that you might not always have sat down with for coffee at church. If somebody comes into your mind, don't think, oh, oh yeah, and just think about that person. Why don't you see that maybe as a prompt from the Lord to pick up the phone or send a message and just encourage the people that you know about in the church. It might be that you know of some single parents who need some encouragement and support at the moment. It might be that you know someone who lives on their own, who doesn't have maybe the family that you have around you to support them. Why don't you become that family around them and get in touch to support them? Maybe you know of some, some vulnerable or elderly people who, who need some love and some care and some support at, at this time. It might be as simple as picking up the phone or, or sending a video message or offering to do their shopping. But let's love God passionately, but let's love one another as well. So the first thing was God broke up the party. But the second thing, which I think is really interesting, is what happened next was the church became a church outside the walls. That's what happened when the persecution began. So in Acts 8, in chapter, sorry, in Acts 8, verse 1, it says, All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea. And Samaria, Judea was the, the immediate surrounding around Jerusalem. That was the very familiar religious context in which they were. But Samaria was a place of people that they hated. It was people who you know, had similarities in terms of their belief in God, but they, they had made all sorts of compromises in the past. And the Jews hated the Samaritans. But it said that when this persecution broke out in Jerusalem, they were scattered to Judea and then to Samaria. Only the apostles remained behind. And then in verse 4 it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They preached the word wherever they went. Outside my house at the moment we have a lot of these dandelion clocks. This dandelion clock is the, the logo of Hope Church. And when we were praying before the church even began, God gave us this picture of a dandelion clock as an image of what he wanted to do with his people when we came to Corby. And if you think about this dandelion clock, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's intricate and, and it's so beautifully designed by God. And, and when you look at it, you think all of those gathered seeds, they look so amazing. And as they, they are there on the stem, you think it looks so beautiful when they're together. But the purpose of this isn't that they stay together, it's that the, the seeds are scattered. And when the wind blows, the seeds are scattered. <sighs> Sorry, Carol. Carol's our cleaner. Um, <sighs> I'll clean them up, don't worry. <laughs> but the idea is that the seeds that were gathered when the wind blows are then scattered. And then 
every single seed has the potential to become one of these. And so every seed that plants itself somewhere, wherever the wind blows it, can grow to become a dandelion and eventually form another gathering of seeds. Can you see why that's such a powerful picture of the church? So even though they were gathered together in Jerusalem, enjoying life and enjoying the favour of, of God and enjoying the favour of people, God broke up the party and then scattered them so they would become a church without walls. The Holy Spirit blew, not in a way that they recognised, but as they were scattered, it says that they preached the word wherever they went. There's something that we need to understand about the word of God. The word of God has innate power. That means it has power in it. We don't understand. There was a parable in Mark 4 where Jesus talked about um, the planting of seeds and how you know we can go to bed and we can go to sleep and then wake up. And, and while we were doing nothing, the seed began to grow. We don't understand how the kingdom of God works. But we know that when we plant the seeds, the seed grows completely independently of us. And so all we need to do is to proclaim Jesus to share the message of good news that we have, to sow the word of God, and God will do the rest. And these people, as they went, they shared Jesus. We have the most amazing good news. Um, and we have the opportunity at this time to share that good news in ways that perhaps we've never shared it before. People are hungry. Let me tell you, I've seen so many people online, and that people are so hungry to... For, for spiritual things. People are asking questions about God. Um, what Richard said uh, earlier before he prayed is absolutely true, that there's a hunger that's, ha that's in our nation at the moment that I haven't seen for a long, long time. And, and if it's true what he says about the Bible sales going through, it doesn't surprise me because people are looking for answers. They're looking for, for truth. And here's something that's interesting. Maybe um, we can pull up that slide again um, from Acts 8, verses 1 and 4. Look at this. When the people of God were scattered because of this persecution, the only people who didn't go were the apostles. What does that tell you? That tells you that this movement, this outbreaking of life because the people of God were scattered, wasn't leader-led. It was almost like the potential, like the, the apostles had been sowing into the people of God and building them up and there was, there was a growing faith and people were filled with the life of Jesus. And then when they went, all of the potential that was in them was released and wherever they went, life broke out. The gospel was shared, the word of God was sown. And then in verse 4 it says, those who had been scattered preached. Who are the, the those? Who are those. Those are all of the Christians, not the leaders, not the apostles. Every Christian, wherever they went, they shared Jesus and life broke out. And so I'd encourage you today to be the one who is like that, that you believe that Jesus is in you and because Jesus is in you, because you have his word to share, because you have the message of hope, that you are bold to share Jesus with all of those around you. I once heard a guy, you've heard me tell this story before perhaps, but there was a guy called Lawrence Singlehurst, and he wrote a famous book called Sowing, Reaping, Keeping. And he used to preach everywhere about evangelism, about sharing Jesus. And one day he, he remembered going to a big meeting full of Christians and preaching his heart out, and he thought to himself, wow, that was a great message. I've just preached and encouraged the church to share Jesus. And then he got in his car and as he drove home, he realised that he was driving past all of these neighbours that he had never met. So he was getting in his car, in his driveway, driving past all of these people in the houses, in the street that he had never met, to go and tell people to share Jesus with people who hadn't met him yet. And he thought, there's a disconnect here. He's preaching at all of these big meetings, he's preaching about Jesus and preaching about sharing Jesus, but he wasn't applying it in his own life. And so he did something very brave. He decided, he had heard that there was a poker night in a garage in one of the, the houses in the street. And all of the men from the street were coming to this poker, poker night. There was smoking, he hated smoking. And there was drinking, he, he didn't drink. Um, and they were gambling, they were playing card games and, and playing for money. And he hated gambling, but he thought, 
I'm going to be where Jesus would be. I'm going to be the friend of sinners. And I'm going to go into this garage and I'm going to make friends with my neighbours. And so he did. And he went along. He didn't smoke and he didn't drink. But he played the card games. He didn't gamble. But he got to know his neighbours. And then he realised over time that when one of his neighbours had a problem, it was him that they were coming to. And when they had a, an issue with their marriage, it was him they came to. When they wanted to borrow a, a garden tool, it was him they came to. There was something that happened in this building of relationships, which meant that he had, without realising it, become the pastor of his street. And I want to encourage you, during lockdown, to become the pastor of your street. To love your neighbours. Not just to, to say, love God with all your heart soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Just don't parrot it off as, as a religious um, saying. Put it into practice. What does it look like to love your neighbours during lockdown? You can't physically contact them, but why don't you stand at the door on Thursday evening and be the loudest cheerleader for the, the key workers? Why don't you be the one who is the kindest, the most thoughtful? You see the single parent and you see the the elderly couple who can't get out to the shops and you're the one that's offering to go to the shops for them. Or it might be that, that you are um, able to do what Richard did and put a video on your Facebook. Um, I did that a few, t t St John's in Corby are doing some amazing things online at the moment. And Andrew Silly, who's the curate at St John's, challenged me to put a video of my testimony on my social media. And so I did it, just two or three minutes, just very basic saying, what my life was like before Jesus, how I met Jesus, and the difference he's made to my life. It only took two or three minutes, it was a very condensed version, and I started by saying, I want to tell you how Jesus has changed my life. And then I spoke for two or three minutes, I posted it on my social media with the hashtag, Jesus changed my life. And many, many people who never go to church saw that video, over 100 people I believe, and, and for, for Richard over 200 people saw that video, and many of his non-Christian friends commented on it because they were curious to know what happened in his life. When he became a Christian, they all thought he was going through a phase, but it turns out that all of these years later that Jesus really has changed his life, and he's done the same for many of you. And so, um, can I say, I want to dare you to put your testimony on your social media, just two or three minutes, and say, open by saying, I want to tell you how Jesus changed my life. Put the hashtag, Jesus changed my life at the end. And then just see what God does. Imagine a hundred people in Hope Church doing that. The thousands of people that would be reached with our stories. So when the, the persecution came and the church was scattered, the church was outside of the walls. But then thirdly and finally, the church quickly realised that this was exactly what God had planned. It looked like a terrible mistake. The persecution looked like it shouldn't have happened. It spoiled the party in Jerusalem. But they quickly realised that God was in it. And this was his design. This was his plan. They didn't understand. The Bible says that his ways are above our ways. And sometimes when we're going through difficult times, when we're going through low moments, when we're going through financial struggles or relationship breakdowns. We don't understand what's going on. But that, my brothers and sisters, is why we need faith. Faith is trusting God. God sees the bigger picture and he promises in his word that he will work all things together for good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If that's you today, he has promised to take the worst things in your life and to work them together for good. God has a plan. God has a plan in all of this too, coronavirus. He has a plan. Now, turn with me to Acts chapter 11. I've got a couple of maps here that I want to show you. So Acts chapter 11, from verse 19. This is beautiful. So we know that the church has been scattered. This is now a little bit further on in the book of Acts, in chapter 11. It says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, travelled as far as Phoenicia. Now, Phoenicia is that red strip along the side um, there, and it's a region. And Cyprus, which is that island there, and Antioch, which is, is a city um, further north. So it says that, that when this persecution broke out, they travelled as far as these places, Phoenicia, Cyrus, Cyprus, 
Antioch, spreading the word. Initially, they spread the word only amongst the Jews. Now, if you're used to doing things a certain way, you tend to do what you're used to doing. And so in Jerusalem, they would share the word with the Jews. They thought maybe Christianity was just an extension of Judaism. They thought the, the Messiah was just for the Jews because they hadn't understood what the Old Testament scriptures were pointing towards. But then in verse 20 on the next slide, it says, Some of them, however, men from Cyprus, which is that island, and Cyrene, which is actually at the, the tip of Africa there. It says, they went to Antioch which is outside of Jewish territory. It's where lots of non-Jewish people would have lived. They, they would have been the Gentiles, the Greeks. It says that they began to speak to Greeks also, not just the Jews, but Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And then something amazing happened. It says the Lord's hand was upon them and a great number of people believed and then turned to the Lord. And what was that? In Acts chapter 1, before he went back to be with the Father, Jesus said this to the disciples. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. This was exactly how God had planned it. The persecution looked like a mistake. It looked like everything had gone wrong, but actually it turned out to be an amazing opportunity because God was now fulfilling his plan through his people in ways that they hadn't expected. And I've got a little uh, image here, a graphic of what this looked like. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And what I want to finish by saying today is that we might not understand everything that God is doing in this moment, but I believe that God is at work in ways that we hadn't planned. We're not clever enough. God's ways are above our ways, but he has a plan in this. And I've been praying for a revival in our nation. And I believe that the ground is, has been so dry. Secularism, materialism, people turning away from God. The, the spiritual atmosphere in, in the UK has been very dry for a long time. But when a match is struck and lights dry ground, suddenly a fire breaks out. And I've been praying for the fire of revival to spread across our nation at this time. It won't look like previous revivals. We can't touch each other. There won't be any of the laying on of hands stuff. But the power of God is the same. The Holy Spirit is the same. And, and you know that the Holy Spirit has been visiting Muslims in their sleep, revealing Jesus, the man in white to them. Why couldn't he do the same in people's, in people's lives in the UK, in people's dreams in the UK? Why couldn't he do that? He can. And so we need to pray and we need to believe God that he's going to do something spectacular during this time. We don't understand it. We hadn't planned it. It looks like everything's gone wrong. But God is in this and he has a plan and we need to believe that, that what's happening now is part of God's bigger purposes. And so, child of God, I would encourage you, draw close to Jesus. Love your brothers and sisters. Reach out to your neighbours. Don't see this as a terrible mistake but a great opportunity. And God's going to use this for his glory. God bless you. Let's pray. Father God, we love this story because it shows us just how incredibly amazing you are and Lord thank you that you are way cleverer than us we couldn't have planned some of this stuff but you have a plan father thank you that we we seem out of control a lot of the time but you are in control you are sovereign and on your throne and father you are working out your purposes and so, Lord God, we say, would you come in power in our lives? Would you come in power in our families? Would you come in power in Hope Church and, and across the churches of this town? Would you come in power in Corby? Would you come in power in our nation? Would you come in power across this world and reveal your glory? Draw people to yourself. And Lord, we pray, Father, that you'll make us bold to share the, the word of God because it's not our cleverness and it's not our intelligence and it's, it's not our planning and it's not... Father, our strategies, Lord God, it's the power that is innate in your word, Father, as we sow it, Lord God. It goes to work in people's hearts. Give us boldness by your spirit to sow your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, we're going to finish um, with a time of worship.